Welcome everyone. My name is Jenny Harrison and on behalf of the organisation committee I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce our keynote speaker and my esteemed colleague Dr Cathy Foley. Cathy is the Chief Scientist at CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency and Innovation Catalyst. Cathy has made significant contributions to the understanding of superconducting materials and to the development of devices using superconductors to detect magnetic fields and locate valuable deposits of minerals. She has received many awards and honours for her work and her efforts to tackle gender equality in STEM. In 2020, Cathy received an Order of Australia for Services to Research and to the Advancement of Women in Physics and was named a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. As a leader in CSIRO, she is working to enhance collaboration across the sector and to turn more world-class research into the benefits for the nation. Welcome, Cathy. Hi everyone, my name is Cathy Foley. I'm CSRO's Chief Scientist. And it's a great pleasure to be invited to be the opening keynote speaker at the CSRO Future of Meeting Symposium. Before we get into my presentation, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and the land we're meeting on today and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Today, I want to talk about the way we work together the way we do science and how it's changing and how it's been driven by digital technologies. What are the impacts and opportunities and how will we need to adapt to take them into account? How will this change the way we communicate as scientists via conferences, which are a very important part of being a researcher and how it impacts our meetings, publications and also the way we collaborate? How can these changes be leveraged to create an environment for accelerated and more inclusive science? I want to go back to some of the very first meetings, and this is looking at 1927, where a very eminent group of people, and you can see here many Nobel Prize winners, got together for the first time to actually talk about quantum science at Solvay. And it's really interesting, apart from the fact there's only one woman who just by the way, also had won a, uh, two Nobel Prizes, while all the other people there, male, had only won one, it was really interesting that they were discussing quantum science. And in this, it was interesting that you can see Albert Einstein in the center there. Although probably one of the most brilliant people ever in humankind's history, he actually questioned whether quantum science actually was correct. And he asked the question, does God play dice? Because quantum science and quantum physics is all about probability. So it just goes to show how important it is when everyone gets together we hear all voices because it's not just the brilliant and most brilliant that necessarily know the right way forward. For myself, back in the 1970s when I was at university, gathering together as scientists was really important and being able to discuss things and sort our way through the work is really, really critical. These days, of course, conferences are something which are ubiquitous um, part of being a scientist. And you can see here, this is just a photo which often happens at any conference where everyone gets together for that conference photo. You can see there's quite a, a group of diverse people there, but that's something where the best, best conferences happen, good outcomes come by bringing people together. And scientific conferences are a cr critical part of the scientific process. It's where we discuss different ideas, we sort through the research, we are, are able to check whether the conclusions are valid. Have we interpreted the data correctly? Are our assumptions correct? Is there anything that we've missed in our research? And is there a possibility that we can join up and do something together which is bigger, better or more important? And also, more importantly, it gives us a chance to learn about the latest of other people's work before it's actually published. And I know from my own experience over many years, I found conferences being absolutely critical for my research. It allowed me to leapfrog over knowing what other people had done and build on that so that my work could progress more quickly. So conferences, workshops and symposia are often also where new fields of research start, such as with that uh, meeting about quantum in, uh, COVID, in um, Solvay in 1927. And that is why CSRO funds these cutting edge symposia programs. But conferences have become really varied. 
You've got these big ones, such as the um, discipline-based one in, such as the American Institute of Physics March meeting in the USA. It can have more than 10,000 attendees each time. They're so big, you only get 10 minute talks, although there are a few plenary talks as well. And hugely international, absolutely fantastic place to meet lots of people. It allows you to see different sub-disciplines, say in the case of physics, and I found it really useful to be exposed to different areas of research. There's also the probably more common ones, which are medium-sized ones, where they've got a couple of hundred people focused on a sub-discipline, and you're able to get into more depth. And then finally, there's the small conferences, up to about 100 people. They're very focused. There's usually very in-depth discussion, and they can allow, or I've seen it happen, reset of research direction. This is, you know, the classic very large conference, which you can see here is uh, something where it's pretty impersonal, but there are things that you can get from going to these conferences, because conferences have become big business. And so with it, there's the travel associated with it, there's the economic stimulus, believe it or not, so that international visitors, the tourism, the venue, catering, hotels and accommodation, new money coming into a, an area, particularly if it's an overseas conference, journals who publish the special issues relating to the conference outcomes, it helps them to build their brand and the impact factor. A conference organizer is a business in itself and of course the exhibitions where we are able to see new and interesting equipment which might lead us to be able to purchase and make um, capital um, capital purchases and operational uh, purchases that allow us to progress our research. They generally run for a small profit and so it makes money for the organiser, usually a professional society, and it's a virtuous cycle. Everybody wins. For the team it's really important. Uh, often when teams go to conferences together it's actually time out to engage socially. You get to talk shop without the distraction of family or experiments and meetings that distract you from your everyday life. And of course, remember that your team members are humans and are actually nice people who you can enjoy their company with. Something that's really important because often when we're chasing deadlines, we can sometimes be a bit fractious amongst ourselves. It's a wonderful shared experience and something which I know my conference attendances with many of my um, team members have always been something very special to me. And often it's where we're able to sit around and discuss new ideas for our projects. And as I mentioned before, it gives us a chance to look at the equipment and exhibitions and get ideas for new methods of the way we do our research. And for me personally, conferences have been absolutely critical. They help you find your, new, your next job. You meet people who could be a future collaborator. They help to build your networks and you meet people who might review your paper or grant so they get to put a face to a name. And you also get to build your scientific reputation, which is absolutely critical for a researcher to go through over their career. I just want to briefly go through how conferences helped me. When I was an honours student, I went to my first conference at the Wagga Wagga Condensed Matter um, Conference held by the Australian Institute of Physics. There, I met John McFarland and Paul, uh, John Dumploff and uh, uh, and a number of other people from the CSIRO. So that when I applied for a job um, as a grad, early, when I was graduating from my PhD, because they had met me at the conference, because I had through that network of meeting them used equipment at their labs to do some of my PhD experiments, I got my first job, which was a postdoc. I worked there and eventually got an ongoing position. And, uh, and then I got to level six and I put a, my hand up to go to level seven and I failed my, that promotion. It wasn't, wasn't uh, granted. I must admit, I was pretty devastated. It's not often that I failed at things, although it's always a good learning experience. But what I found was, and the feedback was at that stage, I'd been a, a young mum with three kids, all under six, and I hadn't had the chance to travel much. And so it was identified that my international reputation wasn't what was necessary to be identified as a level seven researcher. So that's when I started to go to the occasional international conference. So my first international conference at CSRO was the International Conference of um, Superconducting Electronics in 1995 in Japan. And then I kept on going to different conferences after that. I did get my promotion, by the way. Um, and, and I went back to the same conference and or three related conferences. 
And at, with those conferences, I started to meet different people internationally. One of them was actually in 1997, was with, um, Mike Green from the Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And he mentioned to me that he was going to be visiting Australia. So I invited him to come and visit our lab. Since that time, he has been a major uh, sponsor for our research team and a personal mentor for me. He was the conference organiser for the Applied Superconductivity Conference held, that was going to be held the following year in Palm Springs. And because he'd come and visited us, he invited me to be more involved with the conference. Also, Gordon Donaldson, who was from Strathclyde University in the UK, also, um, also uh, at that conference was invited to do a sabbatical at CSRO. And as a consequence of that, I, he asked me to be involved with um, journal editorships. And so I was invited to be on the board of the Journal of Superconductor Science and Technology. I've been on that board ever since and now the editor in chief, as you'll see later. So the Applied Superconductivity Conference is held every two years. And um, some year, so two years later, one at Virginia Beach, I was elected onto the board that organises that conference and, and really cemented my relationships internationally. Um, I was then asked to chair the International Conference of Superconducting Electronics, which we held in Manly in Sydney. And this was an incredibly important conference for our team because it put us on the world map as being one of the leading teams in high temperature superconducting electronics. Then later on in another super, uh, applied superconductivity conference, I was invited to be a plenary speaker as well as the publication chair for that conference. Being a plenary speaker at that conference is really critical and was able to highlight to the broader community the importance of CSRO's work. And then following on at the um, 2008 conference in Seattle, at a workshop looking at whether or not high temperature superconductivity had been successful, I was able to put my hand up, terrifying as it was, and say, actually, our Lantim system had been very successful commercially. And as a consequence of that, people in the audience heard this and they mentioned the, our research in two nature uh, papers, which were uh, uh, op-eds talking about the success of high temperature superconductivity since its discovery. After that, I was invited to be the fast track or letters editor for Superconductor Science and Technology now and then um, some years ago, the Editor-in-Chief, which I still am. Uh, again, I was asked to be another plenary speaker at the ASC, the first person to be asked twice. And again, cementing CSRO's reputation in superconducting electronics internationally. But it hasn't also just been a personal thing for me. It's also helped us develop LANTEM and get it to be commercially available. LANTEM is a mineral exploration tool you can see it in the top uh, right hand corner where it's a fully developed system and it was commercialized by Outer Rim Developments. And you can see in the center there um, the examples of where uh, the squid system, which was a system which we developed, was more successful at seeing um, mineral deposits. And you can see the red ore body, which was largely undetected by the normal coil and very strongly detected by the squid. And so as a consequence, had interest by the mineral exploration industry. But it didn't happen overnight. It was a 13 year effort of which going to conferences was really critical. Back in 1991, we did our first field trials with BHP that showed how successful an instrument it was. Eventually BHP used this system uh, in their Cannington uh, X uh, mineral um, prospecting area and found that there was a double load silver that was deline delineated this eventually became a $2 billion mine, which came on online 18 months earlier, just because of our, our um, delineation process. Unfortunately, back in 1995, there was a bit of a downturn in the minerals industry. BHP pulled out uh, because they decided to back only one of two instruments they were going with, and they decided to go with a gravity gradiometer. So we took over uh, the commercialization of this in CSR, and we started going to the um, different mineral exploration conferences. So first of all, we went to Hobart, Australian Society of Exploration Geophysics, and did an, and exhibited our squid system that was working. It was the first time that people had seen such an instrument working, were fascinated by it. And we kept going back in 99, um, that we and then found that an ex-BHP geo, um, ex geophysicist recommended our system to Falcon Bridge 
in Canada because they wanted to find um, they had a problem finding nickel. And the picture I showed previously was the outcome of that work. Then we started going to the USA and in 2000 went to the Society of Exploration Geophysics to demonstrate our work um, and then went up into the Arctic again because of the interest in, in um, North America. Then we came back to Australia and showed uh, the instrument again in 2001 and, um, and also in the USA in 2001. Then we went to Adelaide in 2003 and then finally in, in Sydney in 2004 at that ASCG conference we found that uh, one of the companies that have been watching us from afar, Outer Rim Developments, came forward and said they wanted to license, manufacture and uh, sell this instrument as well as use it for themselves. Since then, Land Temp has had a life of its own. And this is an example of how we know what's going on when we see its use being reported in ASX, um, the Australian Stock Exchange, uh, reporting of any discoveries that they've made recently. You can see in the bottom, pictures there of the land tem system. But most of all, the thing that's wonderful about conferences are they're fun. There's something which really pulls you out of your comfort zone and gets you to meet different people. You get to travel and be able to experience great enrichment of science and, and wonderful things that allow you to think differently and freely and you come away just buzzing. But in parallel with that, science is also changing. And so we can't just sit back and say things are going to keep going the way they are. Digital opportunities have come by and we're seeing this happening now. Uh, we're also under a lot of budget pressure. Uh, there's not as much money around and so therefore we have to think about how we can do our research as effectively as um, we normally could do, but with a lo lower uh, bottom line. And also research is becoming inter and multidisciplinary. So it's really hard to get to lots of different conferences when they, it's so expensive. If we look at the lab work that we're doing, it's changing as well. We're seeing animal testing, for example, being able to be done on organs on chips, such as reported recently by the ACDP group who were able to put a lung or, or lung type cells on a Petri dish for testing. Then we've got things like Genome Foundry, which allows us to um, have cultured artificial tissue. We're seeing in chemistry, we're moving away from doing going straight into using wet labs to actually doing in silico work. We're going from manual work to automated, such as in the RAMP um, chemical robotic lab in, in Clayton. And we're seeing data visualization where the brain and computer interface is allowing us to interpret data better. In field work, we're going from going out into the field and just on various trials and collecting data to having hi-fi in-field ubiquitous sensors collecting information and being able to provide that and analysis in real time. And all this has required us to make the most of high performance computing, such as the Pawsey computer, which was up, upgraded last year, and advances in artificial intelligence, um, 5G and quantum, which are all coming together. So that we're getting to a point where we have ubiquitous um, e-research infrastructure. We also have a new ecosystem for science and technology with open science, data sharing and cooperation, which is cr more critical than ever. Open innovation, where instead of everybody working on separate things, we're having co-creation and challenge mod models. And our missions are an example of that, where we've got a single focus and everybody working out how their research can apply to solving a great problem. In order to make sure we know where the research is coming from and that we can acknowledge it and trace it so that um, people get their, um, their, uh, their work reflected in rewards and attribution, tokenization of their research is underway. And the whole way scientific publishing is developing with peer review becoming, uh, for example, uh, double blind or open access or crowdsourcing through to um, journals themselves becoming open access making sure that this source data is available and that even publishing be, uh, or putting things up on websites such as archive before they've been, um, been through their peer review process. These are changing, but going back, what is most important is the repeatability, statistical significance, and of course, the integrity of the research. Future of science then is more data driven. It's going to have data streams that direct, are linked directly to the data without process conceptualization. We're going to see scientists be more augmented, better interfaces, 
intelligence and we're going to collaborate and communicate more differently, whether it's with a machine or with other humans. More complex tasks will be automated using techniques such as reinforced learning, computers, learning from computers. We're going to see an explosion in tools to understand how to exploit data types from image, video, speech and text. And science publications will use formats understandable by computers so that complex reasoning can occur automatically. These are all things we're going to be working towards. That was happening, but then of course at the beginning of this year along came COVID. What we saw were meetings cancelled, such as the American Physics, that large March meeting was cancelled, and it was actually cancelled the day before it was meant to start, even though everything had been set up. We've seen many meetings delayed, and one example of that is the uh, International um, Women in Physics Conference, which was planned to be held in July in uh, Melbourne, which br was bringing together women from 80 different countries to come and see how we could learn from each other to improve gender equity in physics. Our conferences are going online, such as the conference you may have noticed those involved with the Applied Superconductivity Conference. Originally planned to be in Tampa in, in um, June in Florida, USA. It's now being moved online for later in October. The way we work today is changing. So we've got digital transformation, and which has been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We've, as a consequence, got more virtual interactions. We're seeing in changes in services such as um, telehealth, and we're getting more and more augmented reality experiences. Technologies um, are augmenting and accelerating our research as well. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, and of course, vast and big data are really critical as well. But the thing that's really interesting is who has been really leading our digital transformation? Well, it's actually been COVID-19 that has progressed that really quickly. It's adapted new ways of working for CSIRO, such as our 70% uh, of our workforce have transitioned to working from home. We've, um, and we're trying to see if we can increase that flexibility, particularly um, with blending working balance between home and work and family. That's an extension of our balance program, which was already under. The flexible working from home will become the norm. And um, the, uh, the fact that CSRO had balance in place already put us in a really good position to progress what we were doing into something which becomes more um, ubiquitous for all of us. And since the uh, COVID uh, pandemic has taken over, we've seen our conference travel grow from about $14 million a year to pretty close to zero, a very big change. So what I've found so far with these changes are that we can Zoom with T or Teams or Google or WebEx all around the world in a day. I've had days where on one day I've had, I've been in the USA in the morning, moved to Asia during the day, Europe, um, and then US again in the night, late at night. It was not every day I want to do that, but it's something which I have done. And in Australia, of course, we we're talking to Perth, Hobart, Brisbane and Darwin, not necessarily in that order, in any one day. I just last week gave a talk at midnight to people in the USA and attended meetings at 4 a.m. in the morning just because they had people from all around the world. Again, something I don't relish, but was still possible. Um, but the thing that's really interesting is I've made some really productive new links as a consequence of this. I found that digital uh, engagement has meant that we can meet a lot more often and we email a lot in between. And I have nailed some new initiatives and opportunities as a consequence of this. Ones which probably have happened faster than if we'd had to travel. So there's some real positives there. I've also found that I've had to change my style. The way I present is really quite different now when doing something on the WebEx. My first WebEx presentation, I have to admit, was pretty awful. I've had to move from doing just in time to being ready to pre-record, such as this one. I've had to adjust to these new deadlines, which is really getting my head around things in a different way. I've also have to acknowledge that it's been a bit anxious to do this, and I've been worrying about things, for particularly, particularly for conferences, of how do we do posters and how do we do virtual discussion? That's something I'm keen to find out how your discussions um, evolve and work out how to do this. There's also something else that's important is how do we get the energy into our presentations 
because we're actually engaging in a 2D uh, experience. But the thing that's really interesting is I've found that these um, virtual meetings have often led to new intimacy in a meeting much more quickly. An example is my board, the board meeting for uh, the journal I'm editor-in-chief of. Normally we have face-to-face uh, -face meetings twice a year. And of course, this hasn't been possible this year. As instead, what I've done is broken up my meetings around the world into different regions. And I was really uh, very privileged at the Asia-based board meeting. The members there who were from China, uh, Korea and Japan, they actually shared things with me which I hadn't ex expected, which they wouldn't normally share in a broader group. For example, uh, how difficult it is for them to referee papers when English isn't their first language and how they're nervous about how they write their referees reports. The other thing which I found interesting was how bad they felt when a reference or, or a referee reports that their English is poor and that they should get an English speaker to review it. Now I realise English is the language of science, but I think it is something which draws out the need for us to be much more responsible. Even in my own experience with my little Joey Scout group that meets on Monday night, we went and moved on to working, uh, doing our Joeys on Zoom, and there you are with their sock puppets they made over the internet. So it's amazing how quickly we've been able to change, create new opportunities across cultures and different things, including um, just our own personal like, um, so there's issues we have to think about. There's different cultural approaches. For example, um, I've noticed when I've been engaging with US-based uh, meetings that they tend to turn their video off as well as their mic off when they're not talking. It's a little bit different, so it's very hard to get that visual um, and cues, even though it's pretty difficult to get it through, through the internet as it is. There's also different cultural norms in doing business, particularly, particularly between East and West. For example, in uh, Western culture, we say the squeaky wheel gets the oil, while in Eastern culture, they say, put your head off, get it chopped off. So there's very different ways of engaging. There's also, it's also interesting to see how we make up a meeting, whether everyone's single on their own, and you see that sort of Brady Bunch look in the different tiles across your com um, computer screen, whether you have different regions where multiple rooms get together, or the mixture of both. One of the things I've found is that it works best, in my opinion, when you either have all single or you have multiple rooms. But the single rooms, single and multiple rooms together, I've found doesn't work that well. And how do we get discussion going so that we get that intimacy and the ability to share ideas and maybe have those side discussions? We've seen the ability to do chat on the side with, um, with uh, the ability to have open and private discussions. Uh, some video uh, conferencing has breakout rooms, which I think are fantastic, and I've seen them work very effectively. But the other is also that you can more formally work your way around so that every attendee is able to get a chance to say something. But again, this can be difficult for such meetings. But one of the things I've found is this is creating a new opportunity for leadership and influence. And this is... Uh, this is a, a picture from a um, seminar I went to, which I was invited to run by the Australian Israeli Chamber of Commerce. And if you look really closely, you can see here it was invite, we were invited to talk to the, um, our treasurer, um, our treasurer Frydenberg. But you'll also look around there, there's uh, uh, John Howard, our former prime minister. And then if you look closely, there's uh, heads of industry and a few vice chancellors. But there's also uh, some people there, such as um, Alan Duffy, who's a lecturer at Swinburne University. So actually, I've found that um, these uh, virtual meetings can actually be a true leveller. So why I am interested in this symposium is because I have this issue, as I've mentioned before, that I'm um, chairing a conference next year of the International Conference of Women in Physics. It's been delayed to July 2021, and it's inviting people from 80 countries around the world or more. Uh, I expect by July next year, travel will not be possible for so many people, for example, coming from Africa, uh, from India, Bangladesh, South America, as well as Europe and um, Northern America. And I'm concerned that it's unlikely that we'll be able to have uh, people traveling. 
and uh, because I expect it will still be, even if there is a vaccine, it won't be readily available for everyone. So how do we do this meeting virtually? How can we build the relationships and the networks? How do I manage these very different cultural issues? How do early career researchers get their in and get those introductions? And what is the role of senior researchers to step up and actively provide those introductions and support? As I mentioned, virtual meetings can work. I've seen them work and they, they can be fantastic. Uh, as I mentioned, they're a leveler. They seem to be, a, it doesn't matter whether you're a prime minister or a very rich person or just a um, person in their early career, you seem to be able to have that same, same level of uh, presence where virtually. Many more can participate because costs are much lower. So therefore it's more accessible, we can be inclusive. Can we be interactive though and provide that networking and great experience and learning from each other scientifically as well as, um, uh, as, well as um, uh, personally? And thinking that also these are incredibly um, more sustainable, both financially as well as environmentally. But we need to make sure these are not just an add-on to our everyday life when we go to a virtual meeting. For example, I've seen conferences which, uh, because they're in a um, different time zone, people are dealing with them all night and then expected to work all day. How do we manage that expectation that you need to have time out from work to go to that conference? How do we create the social links, which are really important to build our careers and our social networks and also the reputation of your research? How do we make sure that the science actually gets done and we are able to dig into the details so that we can understand and pull together new research and engagement in general to make that work? So my call to action for you in this symposium is, well, this in itself is an experiment. What worked and what didn't? How can we use digital meetings to be as effective as face-to-face? -face? And how can we transition to have virtual meetings that help individual and progress the science? So back in 1927, we had uh, researchers uh, coming together to really nut out the beginning of quantum science. Now we've got a new, whole new way of engaging but I think we can make it into something which is even better and more inclusive. So it's not only the Nobel Prize winners and that are coming in, because we know that best ideas come in break from embracing the full human potential. So I wish you luck this week, and I'm looking forward to hearing the outcomes from this, this symposium. Thank you very much.